Azez, the great 10th century Persian scholar, was the first to provide a detailed description of measles, which up until then had been confused with smallpox. In medieval times, measles was a scourge that struck Europe in a succession of cruel epidemics. In 1757, Francis Home, a Scottish physician, used inoculation to protect himself against measles. The technique, a kind of precursor to vaccination, consisted in introducing the pathogen into a volunteer patient's body. Ancient China had already used this procedure to combat the equally devastating smallpox. But the scientific community of the time showed indifference to Holmes' work. In the 19th century, the measles virus was inadvertently exported from colonial Europe to previously unexposed countries spreading like wildfire. In 1851, the disease hit the Faroe Islands near Greenland, and within six weeks, 4,000 of its inhabitants had contracted it. Only five were left unscathed. In the middle of the 20th century, there were significant advances in research in the United States. In 1954, American biologist and Nobel Prize winner John Anders succeeded in isolating the virus. Thanks to his discovery, scientists were able to culture the virus, and progress was made towards developing a vaccine. Using the Edmonston B strain of the virus, in 1963, Anders and his colleagues produced the first vaccine, Rubiovax. In 1971, Atenuvax, a combination of attenuated measles, mumps, and German measles, was the first vaccine to be injectable in one single dose. However, in 1989, scientists recognized the need for a second injection. From then on, each country introduced its own vaccination policy and vaccines. In France, the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and German measles, or rubella, was launched on the market in 1966 and by 1983, it was widely available to the French population. The vaccine contributed to a considerable reduction in the number of fatalities. In 1980, when vaccination was not yet widespread, measles caused 2.6 million deaths worldwide. In 2013, measles killed 147,000 people. In 2013, over 400 people died of measles every day. The vast majority were under five-year-old children living in poor countries with inadequate health systems and insufficient, poorly equipped, remote hospitals. In 2013, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Nigeria, and China were the three countries worst affected by the disease. Vaccination is the most effective tool to combat this highly contagious disease. In 2013, 84% of the world's children were vaccinated. This percentage is even higher in Europe, on the American continent, and in the Pacific. In Africa and Southeast Asia, however, fewer than 80% of children are immunized against measles. But there's no room for complacency. There has been a resurgence of measles in France since the end of the 2000s, and in 2011, there was a full-scale epidemic with 15,000 reported cases. This is likely due to a let-up in vaccination campaigns. Immunization rates had been steadily increasing until 2007, but they are now stagnating, or even decreasing. However, since the year 2000, worldwide, there has been an increase in vaccination campaigns, notably due to the World Health Organization's Global Vaccine Action Plan. 
The aim of the plan is to improve vaccination coverage in countries affected by measles. In 13 years, the number of deaths worldwide has fallen by 75%. While there has been significant progress throughout the world, coverage levels have stagnated in some African countries, and there have been several major outbreaks since 2009. War contributes to the spread of measles. In conflict situations, vaccination campaigns are suspended, health systems collapse, and civilians are forced to flee. The perfect combination for triggering all kinds of epidemics. In Syria, where measles had been all but eradicated, in less than two years, the civil war had caused an epidemic, and in 2011, 7,000 people contracted the disease. The measles virus belongs to the Morbillivirus family, which is closely related to the one that causes swine fever and cattle plague. But unlike many similar viruses, the measles virus hasn't mutated and has retained the same structure for many years. This genetic attribute means that vaccines developed in the 1960s are still effective. An airborne disease, the measles virus is spread by coughing, sneezing, and saliva. Once the virus is in the air, it remains infectious for around two hours. For 10 to 14 days after the start of infection, the disease is in a silent phase and there are no symptoms. A hostile intruder, the virus lodges in the respiratory tract, multiplies, and then enters the bloodstream, where it can reach the body's organs, the spleen, lymph nodes, lungs, and liver. And this is when the symptoms start. High fever, runny nose, cough, conjunctivitis, and sometimes diarrhea. It's also when the infected child is the most contagious. The child can also have a distinctive sign of measles, coplex spots, small spots that appear inside the mouth. Then a rash breaks out. Within four days, small spots appear, initially on the face, before spreading to the rest of the body. And lastly, the skin starts to peel. Most children will have uncomplicated measles and will be tired for about 10 days before recovering. But 10 to 40% will have complications such as ear infections, pneumonia, or other respiratory infections. Measles can be very severe or even fatal for children under the age of five, living in crowded conditions, or who are malnourished or HIV positive. Less common, but more dangerous, is encephalitis, an inflammation of the brain that occurs in one in every thousand cases. It's the complications of measles that can be fatal, especially in children aged under five and adults over 20. In poor countries, measles mortality usually fluctuates between three and six percent, but can be as high as 30 percent in refugee camps and remote communities. There's no specific treatment for the measles virus. Treatment focuses on preventing complications and treating symptoms. Paracetamol for headaches, ointment for eye infections. Antibiotics are only necessary if the patient has a secondary bacterial infection, such as pneumonia or an ear infection. Some of our patients travel from very far away. They come from about 80 kilometers away on bicycles. Thanks to MSF, some of the referred patients come on motorbikes. We go to the health centers to let them know that we're here and sometimes bring them back. So the mothers come here with their little ones on motorbikes. Measles is more severe in malnourished children. In order to prevent severe complications, it is important that the patients receive a balanced diet 
and vitamin A supplements. If a child also has diarrhea and vomiting, rehydration is key. Oral rehydration and, in the event of severe dehydration, an infusion is used. Measles is extremely contagious. One person with measles can transmit it to 20 non-vaccinated people around them. In a humanitarian context, it is said that one case of measles in a refugee camp is an epidemic. Patients should be isolated as best they can, given the means available. To prevent the disease, we have been using the same vaccine for 40 years. It's a live, attenuated vaccine, and in contrast to inactivated vaccines, it protects for a long time. In addition, each dose costs less than one euro. However, like all live vaccines, it needs to be kept in the cold chain, and this is a major constraint. In order to be fully protected, children need to receive two doses of vaccine. The first given from nine months of age, and the second before they're five years old. In extreme situations, like epidemics, in refugee camps, or in malnourished or HIV-positive children, a third supplementary dose is given from six months of age. So the best way to combat measles is vaccination. To prevent epidemics, the vaccine coverage, the vaccination level of a population at a given point in time, must be over 90%. The vaccination coverage reduces or eliminates the number of carriers and stops transmission. We achieve what's referred to as herd immunity. The measles vaccine is one of the best vaccines that is currently available. It was developed in the 60s and made widely available around 1975. It's a live, attenuated vaccine, which means that the virus itself is alive. It grows. It's like biological agriculture. We cultivate it on cells. We purify it, and that's what we inject. It's very effective. A very small amount given in one injection to a one-year-old child provides lifelong protection against measles. You don't have to repeat it. We can make it everywhere. There are factories pretty much all over the world. You have to transport it in a cold chain, and as long as these conditions are met, you have a wonderful tool. So we decided to transform this virus, to develop other vaccines. The measles virus is a sort of misshapen ball with its genetic material in the middle. We take the genetic material, we copy it, it's called cloning, and then we cut it into pieces. And in the middle, we add pieces of AIDS and pieces of dengue fever. We close it up again, and then we grow this new virus. And when we inject the virus into a patient or a volunteer, they are immunized, not only against measles, but also against the AIDS or dengue antigens, which were incorporated into this vaccine. We are currently conducting clinical trials for these products, for chikungunya, for AIDS, and for dengue fever. They're for new vaccines, based on this new, let's say, vehicle, this vector of vaccination. During the 70s, we noticed that children with lymphomas, Hodgkin's, for example, with a swollen eye like this, when they got the measles, the tumor disappeared. Later, it was observed that, in fact, the virus, the measles virus itself, attacks the tumor cells. It especially likes to replicate in these cells, and at the same time, it kills them. So we decided to use the measles vaccine to treat these cancers. We're going to test the efficacy on malignant pleural mesothelioma, which is a cancer of the pleura caused by asbestos. And we're going to put a big dose directly into the pleura of a patient with a pleural tumor. And we're going to wait for the destruction of the tumor. We'll be starting clinical trials in two years' time. And, if it's effective, it could be on the medical market in the next five to seven years.